Welcome to the Red Haired Archaeologist. I am your host, author, and sunscreen advocate, Amanda Hope Haley. Thank you for spending some time with me today, studying artifacts our Near Eastern ancestors left behind, and considering if those items just might change how we read or read into scripture. When we left Egypt last week, the nation was what was called a satrapy of the Persian Empire, and it stayed that way from 525 to 332 BCE. On the whole, the Persians didn't do a whole lot to change the Egyptian culture. They wanted to keep control of people and they wanted to exact taxes, but unlike the Assyrians and the Babylonians before them, the Persians chose to keep control by keeping the newly conquered peoples happy. Instead of moving people around and trying to break and change their culture, the Persians would invest in rebuilding. They rebuilt Egypt the same way that they rebuilt Jerusalem. They also encouraged the local religion. No matter how good your overlords are, no one really likes to be ruled by somebody else, especially somebody from a foreign culture. And so when the Egyptians heard about a new king in the Mediterranean, they got a little excited and they thought that they were going to be saved by this new guy. But today we're going to talk about what happened when that guy showed up and what the Egyptians encountered was really the exact opposite. They were not saved. Their traditional culture was pretty finally decimated. I'm calling this podcast Egypt Between the Testaments because the time period we're covering is from 336 to 30 BCE. This is the time between the Testaments. I was raised Protestant. Sunday school teachers and pastors would talk about this time as the 400 years of silence or the period between the Testaments, something like that. It is a time when we don't have any scriptures in the Bible that directly tie into this history. But this period of history is incredibly important for just the development of the world and then also as a backdrop for understanding what the New Testament world looks like. Forgive me, I'm pausing. <laughs> um, I am recording today from my closet, as I do. And in the background, I just heard that beep, 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 beep happening. Uh, if you've been listening to my podcast for the last few weeks, and if you've been bearing with me through all of this, our entire yard is being excavated by the EPA. <laughs> and I thought we were done with the heavy equipment for today. They're actually going to be laying sod in our backyard. I wonder if they have just arrived with that sod. So I just heard the beep, beep, beep. Um, Nick, I hope that doesn't create too much of a problem for you. I am so sorry. Anyway, in 336 BCE, Philip II was the king of Macedon or Macedonia. The two words tend to be used interchangeably the way Babylon and Babylonia get conflated. Macedon was the city, and over time, the entire nation came to be known by that name. So Macedon, Macedonia, for our purposes, they're the same thing today. So he was the king of Macedon. He went about conquering a lot of the Greek city-states that were around him, specifically Athens and Thebes. When I say Greek for this time period, Greece is not a country the way we think of it today. The area is populated by a lot of different city-states that all war with each other. They weren't the only two city-states. There were lots of city-states. One thing that all of these city-states shared was their culture. They shared the Greek language. They worshipped a lot of the same gods, or if not the same exact gods, gods from the same pantheon. They governed themselves similarly. Greek is a culture for this time period. It is not a nation with boundaries. The Greece we have today is not the Greece we're talking about of the old time. We're talking about a cultural identity, not a national identity. Well, so Philip II in Macedon had conquered Athens and Thebes, and he decided that he wanted to get together with rulers of some of these other Greek city-states around him, form a coalition, and attack the Persian Empire. So he got everyone together. He was obviously a pretty good politician. He got people to agree to this plan, but he ended up getting assassinated by one of his bodyguards. When that happened, his son, Alexander, rose to power. Alexander was only 20 years old at this point, but within 10 years, so by the time he was 30 years old, Alexander would not only accomplish his father's goals of 
defeating the Persian Empire, but he would build an empire himself that reached from the Greek city-states all the way to India, and of course, it included Egypt. So in 332, Alexander was welcomed into Egypt. The Persian satrap who was ruling Egypt at the time, he just surrendered his position without much opposition at all to Alexander. It was a pretty peaceful transfer of power, considering you're going from one major empire to another. Alexander stayed in Egypt for about six months. And while he was there, he founded new cities. Probably the most famous of those would be Alexandria. The city of Alexandria was on the Mediterranean coast at the western mouth of the Nile River. By virtue of its location and then also just kind of being shiny and new, it would become a center for commerce, for education, for art, and eventually would actually become the capital of Egypt. Alexander and the people who came after him would end up reorganizing the Egyptian government so that they followed a Greek system. So he's doing all of this work. He's laying the foundations to change the government. And he's made himself king. But Alexander realizes that maybe he needs to become pharaoh. For these guys, the difference between just being a king and being a pharaoh is whether or not you have the support of the religion. So Alexander makes an important trip to visit the Oracle of Jupiter Amun, where all the people say that the god recognized Alexander as his own son and made a promise that Alexander would become the ruler of the entire world. So this was seen by the people around Alexander as deification by Amun, who was one of Egypt's original most important gods. Because of this deification, Alexander was able to claim rights to rule Egypt, not just as a king, but as a pharaoh. Egyptian priests coronated him as pharaoh at Memphis. And then this also would have ensured that the people who came after him would also become pharaohs of Egypt. But Alexander ruled Egypt for less than 10 years. In 323, Alexander was over in India waging a campaign and became very sick. He made it back to Babylon and he died there. Since he was only 30 years old, there was no real plan of succession. A 30-year-old who has just conquered his entire known world, who is married and has a pregnant wife, I don't think he's thinking about his mortality. So there was no accepted will. His generals got together at Babylon, and a general named Ptolemy, who had been leading all the troops in Egypt, recommended to this council that they split the empire up into satrapies. Going to kind of follow that Persian model there. Break them up into satrapies and put one of Alexander's generals as the satrap over each of those regions. Ptolemy ends up taking Egypt for himself. As soon as this is agreed upon, the sad traps start fighting with each other and some of these borders move in and out. Ptolemy, who is a really excellent general, ends up growing the size of his satrapy, increasing his own power. So then by 305, he actually makes himself an independent king of Egypt. He gives himself the name Ptolemy I Soter, which means Ptolemy I Savior. And he founds what will be the final dynasty of Egypt. Ptolemy wasn't only a great warrior, he was also a really great politician. You see that from the time of the Council at Babylon, where he's able to convince everybody to divide up the empire and give him a giant chunk of it. So what he does in Egypt is he he sets about to improve it, but to improve it in the way that he sees fit. He maybe doesn't have the interest of the native Egyptians in mind. He really wants to secure a dynasty for his own family. So the first thing he does is he makes his own son a co-regent. And then he brings back what was an Egyptian tradition of having royal brothers and sisters marry each other. This is a way of, quote, keeping the bloodlines clean. And more than that, though, consolidating power and really keeping it within the family. Pretty soon, he also claims the title Pharaoh because he also wanted a religious right to the throne. He learned that from Alexander before him. He starts building temples to Egyptian gods, and then he goes even further. He introduces some new gods. He creates Serapis, who is a blending of the old Egyptian gods of Osiris and Apis. And then he also crafts that god so that the god looks like a Greek man. He thinks this largely works for all of his population because it's an Egyptian god at its core, which on a certain level appeals to the natives, 
but it is styled like a Greek god. And so that appeals to the Greeks who are living under him. So where Assyria and Babylonia set out to keep control by destroying native cultures and Persia sort of adopted them into the empire as they were, the Greeks and eventually the Romans will do the same thing. They take charge by blending their own culture into the native Egyptian culture or the native cultures of whichever region you're talking about. They do this blending as a way of eventually pushing people toward adopting their own Greek culture, which obviously they thought was the best culture ever. And this process is called Hellenization. This can work in Egypt because at this time, there's already a large number of Greek immigrants living in Egypt. To further the Greek culture, to Hellenize Egypt, the Ptolemies set about building new, bright, shiny cities like Alexandria. They made these new cities that had Greek names. They made them into centers of art and education, and they did it in or near places where Greeks were already living. So it was easy to have Greek language and Greek culture take control in those areas and then spread it because once there's enough people speaking Greek, then Greek becomes the official language of the nation. And then only Greeks start to fill the upper levels of the aristocracy. The native Egyptians, who've been there for hundreds and thousands of years, they do not prosper in Ptolemaic Egypt the way that the Greeks did. For that reason, there are frequent uprisings during this dynasty that the Ptolemies are pretty regularly putting down. The shining example of Hellenization in Egypt would have been the famous, now gone, library at Alexandria. It's one of the original Seven Wonders of the World, and it was built by Ptolemy I's successor, who was Ptolemy II Philadelphus. Philadelphus wanted to fill this library with all of the important works of literature in the entire world. It's during this time, which he reigned from 285 to 246 BCE, it's during this time period when we know that the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. And that translation is called the Septuagint. I know I talk about it a lot. I'm finally going to tell you where it came from. So there are two theories or traditions as to how we got the Septuagint. The first one is very practical, and that is because of Hellenization, the Jews who were living in Egypt were themselves Greek speakers at this point. They needed sort of an official translation of the Bible for themselves. As Greek speakers, each of the different synagogues had been creating their own translations that maybe were incomplete, that were more or less accurate, but they all kind of differed from each other. And so the motive behind the translation of the Septuagint may have been these Jews wanting there to be an approved translation of the Hebrew Bible. The more famous story, and it's certainly more fanciful, comes to us from a philosopher named Aristobulus. He tells us that Ptolemy II Philadelphus sent a letter to the high priest Eleazar in Jerusalem. And he explained to him that he has this massive project and he's wanting to get all of the great works of literature translated into Greek and put into his library. And Eleazar apparently is amenable to this. He sends 72 scribes to Alexandria, each of whom is a master of the Hebrew language, but also of the Greek culture. Because when you're doing a translation, you have to understand not just the source material, but also the people who are going to be reading it and the way that they are going to interpret words based on their own culture. So he sends 72 people. That is six men from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is where the name Septuagint, this is where that comes from. Septuagint in Latin means 70, not 72. It means 70, but it's based on the number of translators who worked on this project. So they go to Alexandria and for 72 days, they work on the translation, they feast with their hosts, and then they make daily reports in the court at Alexandria as to how they're doing. After 72 days, the translation is completed. Jewish thinkers at the time were not necessarily thrilled by this translation, but it became the official Bible of the Christians. And so the Christians actually add an extra layer of interest onto this story. And they say that not only did this translation happen in 72 days, but that those 72 men were split up into groups of two. And each group of two was isolated in a separate house. So 36 different houses. 
And within those 36 houses, 36 separate translations were created, but all 36 of those were absolutely identical down to literally the last iota, (laughs) the Greek letter iota. The Christians added that. The truth about where the Septuagint came from, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Philadelphus did build the library in Alexandria, and he did want to fill it with the world's knowledge. The Jews living in Egypt did need a copy of their own scriptures in their own vernacular. But where the text really took off was with the Christians. It's the Greek text and not the original Hebrew that became the basis for the Coptic, the Ethiopic, Slavic, all of these different translations of the Bible. It's actually the Septuagint that those are based on for the Christian communities. And of course, the Septuagint has remained the standard version of the Old Testament for the Greek Orthodox Church. So the Ptolemies controlled Egypt for almost 300 years. And during this time, they war with other former satraps in neighboring regions. They put down internal rebellions by native Egyptians who had been marginalized. And they created the Rosetta Stone. A lot gets packed into these 300 years. But probably the thing the Ptolemies are the most famous for is their last pharaoh. That is a woman named Cleopatra VII who ruled off and on from 51 to 30 BCE. When I hear that name, Cleopatra, I immediately picture a glamorous film star. I grew up watching old movies, and I loved the film Cleopatra that starred Elizabeth Taylor. When I was in high school, we read Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. It's one of Shakespeare's quote-unquote histories. And I hear that there's a new version of a Cleopatra film in the works now where Gal Gadot has been cast. She played Wonder Woman. So maybe it makes sense for her to go from playing the Princess Diana, a Greek goddess, to suddenly playing this Greek pharaoh. Because the Ptolemies, they were not native Egyptians. They were not Nubians, as all the pharaohs we've been talking about in the last many weeks have been. They were actually Greek. They were Macedonians. She was a co-ruler with her father until his death. And then after that, she served as a co-ruler alongside two of her brothers, both of whom she married because of that weird thing Ptolemy the first back into power where brothers and sisters married each other. So she served with them, but her second brother ousted her. After that happened, Julius Caesar was in Egypt dealing with some political issues of his own. He met Cleopatra and he spent enough time there to help her regain the throne and also to father a son who would be named Ptolemy the 15th Caesarian. After Caesar's death, Cleopatra gets in league with a man named Mark Antony, who, of course, Shakespeare wrote about. And they end up waging a war against Octavian, which on some level is on behalf of Caesar and Cleopatra's son, Caesarian. Antony and Cleopatra claimed that he was the rightful heir to Julius Caesar's throne and not Octavian. They go to war in the Mediterranean up around the Greek islands. And finally, Octavian defeats them at the Battle of Actium. Antony and Cleopatra flee back to Alexandria, and they just wait there for 10 months. They wait for Octavian to come get them. (laughs) They don't. And after that 10 months, they decide to commit suicide. Octavian does come into Egypt on August 31st, 30 BCE, and he declares himself Pharaoh. If the name Octavian sounds familiar, but you're not quite placing it, you may know him more readily as Augustus Caesar because in 27, he changed his name and became the very first Roman emperor, the emperor who the Bible says was ruling when Jesus was born. The Red-Haired Archaeologist podcast is researched, hosted, and recorded by me, Amanda Hope Haley. It is sound edited by Nicholas Solaire. New episodes are released each Thursday. To interact with me and other listeners, make sure you click the follow button on the Red-Haired Archaeologist pages on Facebook and Instagram. Then check out my website at redhairedarchaeologist.com where you can subscribe to my monthly email and book me to come speak in your town. 